Welcome to Dwell in the Word. Today is Friday. It is July 8th, and this is being posted a little late because with the holiday on Monday, I went to a funeral yesterday. I kind of forgot it was Thursday and woke up this morning and said, it's Friday. It's time for Dwell in the Word. And so here we are in my favorite prayer book, Piercing Heaven. We have another prayer from Philip Doddridge. Let us pray. Every blessed fountain of natural and spiritual life, I thank you that I live and that I may live a faith-filled life. I bless you that you breathe into me your own living breath. Though I was once dead in my sins, now I have become a living soul in a sense that is unique to your own children. But I do not just want to live, I want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I beg you to form my mind in the image of faith. Do not let me misunderstand grace, measuring my growth in grace by a natural yardstick. Let me experience your love even more with unreserved resignation to your wise and holy will and a greater care for others. Strengthen my soul as you help me grow in patience, in humility and zeal, and in a heavenly attitude. Give me a concern to be accepted by you. Whether I live or die, let everything I do be for your glory. You know I hunger and thirst after righteousness. Make me whatever you want me to be. Draw your image on my soul by the gentle influence of your spirit. Trace every feature with your eye, O Heavenly Father. May enjoy and which you may see as your own image. I know I am not yet where I should be. I am far from being already perfect. But after the great example of the Apostle, I forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. Feed my soul by your word and by your spirit. Then I will be born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, even by your word, which lives and abides forever. As a newborn babe, I desire the sincere milk of the word, that by it I may grow, and may by progress be obvious to all, until I finally reach maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And after having enjoyed the pleasure of those that flourish in your courts below, I will come to live in the paradise above. I ask and hope this through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. All right, we read through verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 2. Today we have a big chunk of text. We're going to finish up the chapter and we'll read from verse 6. And it looks like the last verse of chapter 2 is verse 22. Hear the word of the Lord. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines. And they strike hands with the children of foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So man is humbled, and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day, against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low, against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, and against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, and against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft. And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols shall utterly pass away. And people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord, from the splendor of his majesty, when he rises to terrify the earth. In that day, mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to enter the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the of the cliffs, from before the terror of the Lord, from the splendor of his majesty, when he rises to terrify the earth. Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? So in the first part of chapter 2, we read about this time where everyone is going to worship God and there will be peace. It's the whole famous beat their swords into plowshares passage, right? And then the tone turns to a tone of judgment. And the idea here is that there is idolatry, there is rebellion against God, and, and that has to be punished. And once again, we see 
Another example of the way that idolatry is spoken of. Obviously, idolatry is an issue, and it's important that, as always, we remember that while we don't turn um, our silver and our gold into idols that we bow down before, uh, there are plenty of things uh, that we have as idols in our lives, right? Um, It's not a statue. It's not something that we crafted with our hands necessarily, but we have things that we place above God. And so while we can look at this passage and easily say, yes, tear these things down against those people who have these idols, we need to remember that this should convict us of our own sin, that we should be driven to worship of the one true God. Now, as we look at this passage, we see some beautiful poetic language again. Now, it's kind of hard. I I struggle with that word uh, to call it beautiful necessarily because it is uh, words of judgment, but it's very poetic in the way that it's written, in the way the words are repeated. It's it is beautiful literature to read, but then we have the harshness of the judgment. But look at what the prophet has to say in verse eight: Their land is filled with idols; they bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. And this is ultimately the issue with idolatry. I've mentioned before when we've been in passages that mention idolatry that I just don't understand the idea of bowing down before something that somebody made in their shop or something that I made in my shop or something that I sort of formed together. I, I can't, I can't imagine making something and then, you know, bowing down before it as though it's a representation of, of God or of another uh, pagan God or whatever. I, I once did a lot of Sunday school lessons using object lessons. And, and one of the object le- lessons I used was I went and bought a bunch of Play-Doh and I had the students uh, you know make something out of Play-Doh. And then we talked about this idea, idea of idolatry. Chances are we maybe even went uh, to this passage or another passage like it talking about the ideas of bowing down between the work of their hands. And at the end of the lesson, I had the students smash the Play-Doh down because, you know, we're throwing out the idea of throwing out things that we would idolize. But here we see, as God is talking about this, this is more than just, hey, people, turn away. God is talking about the judgment that is going to come. Don't. It's not just God saying, turn away from your idols. Yes, that's being said. But there's this idea of a day of the Lord, a day where judgment is going to come, where God is going to punish uh, this rebellion, this idolatry. And in verse 11, we see that the haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Now, whether that is pride in the work of their hands and this idol that they have made, or whether it is pride in, in their own works or the things that they do, or in their own righteousness, Isaiah lets us know that someday the pride that we have is going to be humbled. The Lord is going to be exalted on that day because he alone is the one that is worthy of praise, worthy of exaltation. And we see right away in verse 12, for the Lord of hosts has a day. He, It seems as though... He is allowing this to pass. But Isaiah is saying, no, no, no. He is being slow. Perhaps he is being patient, perhaps. But there is a day. There is a day of of judgment coming. And we see this in verse 17 and 18. And the haughtiness of the man shall be humbled. There's that idea again of being humbled. And the lofty pride of men shall be brought low. And the Lord alone shall will be exalted in that day, and the idols shall utterly pass away. And so the idea that we see here is not only get rid of your pride, but the idols that you have chosen over the one true God, they're going to go away, and he is going to come in judgment. And so you can choose. You can either worship the one true God. You can worship the maker of heaven and earth, the one who will be exalted The idols that you have, they're done and over with. And the people who are going to be judged are going to enter into caves and the rocks are going to try to escape the judgment of the Lord because it is going to be awful. It is going to be harsh. Uh, Notice how Isaiah says, says it. When he rises to terrify, 
the earth. The judgment of God is a terrifying thing. And so in that day, we read in verse 20, mankind will cast away idols or idols of silver and gold, which they made for themselves to worship. There is that idea again that they made these things themselves. But these things will be cast away because they will realize that they are worthless. And so as this chapter closes up, it tells us in verse 22, stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath for of what account is he? Now we know that God values human life. He created human life. He redeemed human life in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the idea here is if you are making these gods, um, you are acknowledging that you have power over them. You are giving exaltation to humans. You're giving exaltation to pride. But now, What is Isaiah saying? Stop lifting up man and instead exalt the Lord your God. For without God, what what account are we without him? Without him, we have nothing. We are utterly um, nothing. We would not have been created. And if we abandon him, then we are judged for our idolatry. That's the idea of being conveyed here. And so we see that we are called to return to the Lord our God to turn away from the idols, to turn away from our sin and from our human pride, our haughtiness, and instead exalt the God, the maker of heaven and earth. Let's finish up with a word of prayer. Merciful God, we are humbled to be your people and we desire to serve you. For you are the true God, the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth. Your power and majesty are beyond compare and yet we know that in Jesus Christ you have come near to us and we know your love through his saving work for us. Grant that we would turn our eyes from worthless things and instead fix our eyes on you today. As we approach this Friday and the coming weekend, we ask that we would be reminded of Christ's great work and that your spirit would be at work in us that we might desire to pursue holiness. May we seek out opportunities to serve you And may we be blessed with the desire to keep your law, that we might bring honor and praise to the holy name of Jesus. And so, may we step into this day, humbled by the great love that you have given to us in him. Grant us the courage to speak of this love to those around us today, that we might be faithful witnesses to who Jesus is. We pray this all in his holy name. Amen. All right, we are through Isaiah chapter 2 now. So on Monday, we will start back up again in Isaiah 3. We will see you then.